morning I have a guest with me and I'm going to let him introduce himself to us. Good morning. My, my name is Heinz Volkman. I have been attending Maple Ridge Baptist Church for 42 years, since 1979. I came here as a student from Northwest Baptist Theological Seminary, or college, I guess. So here I am. Wow, oh, so good. It's so neat to hear that people have been here for, yeah, 42 years. So you would have come as like a young adult. I was, yes. Yes, very yeah. good. Now tell me about, uh, how did you come to accept Jesus in your life? Um, I actually accepted Jesus at a, um, at a Jantz team crusade. Oh. When I was 15, in, it was in Vancouver. Okay, wow. It was kind of like one of those, you know, Billy Graham type things, except for the Jantz team were four brothers who, um, ministry was primarily in Germany. Okay. And, right. but they came here and they did this, um, you know, crusade that some of it was in German, but some of it was in. Oh, so good. So in Vancouver, wow, yeah. 15. Okay, now, so many years later, we won't say how many years later, but tell me, like, 49. 40, thank you for being, you know, I really just couldn't do the math. <laughs> so looking back, um, was it worth it? Has it been worth it? Yes, it, very much so. I think the uh, primary reason that it's worth it is because it gives you assurance of um, salvation, hmm. of eternal life, right. and, and the, the hope that comes with it, and a, and a purpose in life. Hmm. There's uh, something worth living. Yes, ah, well spoken, well said, yes. So, because you've been a part of this church for so many years, not as many as actually some have been here for so, so, so many, which is really neat, but I wanna know from your perspective, what has been the thing uh, that our church has been known for uh, when it comes to reaching out and, and sort of engaging with Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows? I think in, in the early days when I first came here, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the biggest events of the year was the Daily Vacation Bible School right. that June Gustafson ran, and there was like seven or eight hundred kids. Yeah. I like that it, we it, started at five hundred and six hundred and seven. So well, that, wow, that that was the like the um, I I think the uh, final total of um, all the kids. So yeah, it was um, quite something. Yeah, and then there was you know the church was always known for its missions programs right. and. Um, and then also service and you know we've had men that were mayors of our community from our church right yeah. do you mind talking about that a little because that's not something yeah. we've discussed yet Derson and norm jacobson right um both served as mayors right in in the community here which um you know i mean they couldn't give us grant us any special favors but no. it, it was still um something that guys from this church would serve in that capacity was, For sure. in, was important. Yeah, and even at our sister church, Burnett, right? Like uh, Ernie Dakin yes. would have, yeah, that's so neat. What about, that's Randy Camp would have been an MP, right? He was, yeah, yes. for several terms. Yes. So. That's really neat to yeah, see. Yeah, and Nor Norm Jacobson was also the MLA. Oh, really? Um, yeah, he was actually at the, I think, I believe he was the health minister of BC at one time. So. Wow. Wow, that's fascinating, hey? Like to see, uh, often we think of like people uh, influential uh, as a part of our church and they have to be like in ministry or vocational ministry, right? And and the fact that now we've seen that people are influencing our city, but part of our church, but in a in a professional way. Yeah, and yeah. then there was also like, you know, well-known business people right. in, the, in the community, like Owen Fuller and yes. you know the whole Fuller Watson thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, we heard some really interesting stories about uh, not necessarily a bus, but what was it that they've got their uh, their van or something that would take kids that, around? I think that preceded my. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I've heard stories, but I. Yeah, you can't you confirm know, not, or deny. Not, not from personal like yeah that's neat okay so vbs vacation bible school and and just seeing the fruit of that and and then missions what would that have looked like uh from your perspective the the mission well it wouldn't have necessarily borne fruit right here in maple ridge yeah. but certainly the church was known for um supporting missionaries ar around the world whether right. it's africa or pakistan yes and um so we've had numerous missionaries, the Afflecks and the yes. Gustafsons yes. and Elaine Eby, who just like retired maybe two years ago or so right. after being there for very many years. Right. 
Yeah, that's so neat to see, uh, again, just people just engaging and, and wanting to see the gospel go forward. It's pretty neat. Um, I'm interested in knowing about, for you, either was there a person or a program that specifically influenced you or that kind of helped you in your, in your faith journey? Well, um, initially I, when I came here, Ian Bowie was the pastor. Yes. And I, he had also been my pastor when prior to me coming here, I attended Cloverdale Baptist. Yes. And as a young person, and he was um, very influential in, in helping me establish my faith. Yeah. And then, but I, I would say that the person most influential was um, Art Birch. Really? Okay. Yeah. Talk to me about why. Why was he influential? Well, he um, he came here in 1993. Right. Uh, Brenda, he married Brenda and myself. Oh. I think, I believe it was the first wedding he did. Wow. Um, here. Yeah. Because it was just a few months afterwards. Yeah. And um, I, I served um, on the church board um, almost the entire time that he was here. Right. I, I believe it was about... He was here 16 or 17 years. Really? Yes. Yeah, and and so I was I was the board chair for a considerable amount of that time. Right. And so we developed a close uh, friendship and mm. bond, which still exists today. That's so nice. That's what we are hearing. Not only the fact that uh, it's interesting. Joan was mentioning that she had um, that yeah some relation. Well, just somebody like that mentored her uh, was a part of the Birch family, and that that name like even for Larry Gustafson that it was I believe it was Art's brother that had passed, and that that completely influenced his life. And yes. just again. Um, just people doing life together and then this continuing friendship and this real investment in life together, right? And that it is a community that you're, you're, yeah, kind of encouraging each other in, in walking with Jesus, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Um, what is it about, like when you think back on uh, kind of the life shared with art or even other people um, that was the most impactful? Was it the honesty or prayer or, you know, encouragement to read scripture? I, I would say he was a very well-rounded individual yes. in terms of like prayer and care, yes. um, evangelism and all that. So I, I can't uh, point to any one specific thing that's uh, more important than others. But yeah. I think the ministry that I saw was most, that had the most impact was a program he um, established called Evangelism Explosion. Right, yes, we heard about that. Yeah, and um, you know, for several years, um, the, our church led our national fellowship in conversion growth, membership growth. Wow. And baptisms. Really? So it was very, um, it had a huge impact on our, on our the church and our community. Wow. I personally didn't, I was going to join it, but yeah. by the time I got around to it, it wasn't, around anymore. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, but it was um, pretty good. Yeah, it was good. That's neat. Yeah. Cause that's often what we talk about is um, life transformation, right? And you really see that when somebody takes that step of baptism or, you know, gives their life to Christ in those beginning moments, like that means that something has changed in them and that they're going yeah. to, yeah. So that's, that's neat to sort of talk about that. Um, so that's sort of a mentor uh, for you. Now I'm wondering, when you think about the next generation and what's going to encourage them in their faith and what's like, is it mentorship? Is it, you know, trying to find that person to imitate as they imitate Christ? Or is it, what is that sort of key or that thing that you hope for the next generation? I, I think that mentorship is very important. Hmm. Um, I had the one individual that I, that I would point to um, who, um, is no longer with us. It was Frank Fair. Yes. And uh, he, he was um, a very kind, gentle um, person who led by example. And I remember one time I was, um, there was a particularly stressful situation going on in, in the church at mm. that time. And just out of the blue, he called me. Mm. And at the very the perfect moment, at the right moment, and um, just sort of asked me how he was doing and offered me some advice and mm. things like that. So I think that it is very important that um, people, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to be old to mentor somebody. No. And you don't even have to call it mentoring, just be their friend. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can have a, a sort of a, 
you know, one of the people that would probably say that I mentored him mm -hmm. would have been James or Jim, whatever you want yep. to call him, Zelinsky. Yes. But it's kind of also turned around mm. so that now it's kind of like he can do it to, for me as well, mm. right? So it's, it went into a, um, a friendship and a, a, like a relationship which is two-sided now. It's not right. just a one-sided thing. Yeah, that's amazing, right? Like that yeah. you've gone through life and built relationship with with him or with other people I know that, mm -hmm. yeah, like you currently serve on the board right now and you guys share life together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of are able to pour into each other's lives and also to support our pastoral team and staff here, which is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah sort of together, that's neat. Um, what, so if that's sort of your prayer and, and what your hope is for our church, what, if you think about the next hundred years, right? Cause this is like a beautiful picture that our church has even lasted for 109 years. It's pretty rare. It is very rare, right? And yeah, yeah it's, um, we hope that we're gonna continue for another hundred years, right? Like by God's grace, that that would be possible would be amazing. And so what do you hope for? What do you, what do you hope that uh, somebody would say about our church when they would write about our history uh, for those next I, hundred years? Yeah, I, th I think it's crucial that um, uh, our church is going to be known in our community that faith without works is dead. Mm. That people are going to see what we do mm. in the community, you know, to, well, it, does, it doesn't really matter who we do it for, mm. but we have to be seen to be doing things mm. because that gives us the opportunity and gives us the right to tell them about our faith. Right. Just going up to somebody and saying, um, you know, you need to believe in my God isn't gonna cut it if they don't if if they don't see that in action. Right. Yeah. And so I think I think that that's really important. We can't isolate ourselves here. We've we've stuck over a hundred years with an unwavering um unwavering belief. Uh, in in truth, right? Mm -hmm. Like we haven't changed our our theology, mm -hmm. and we need to keep with our theology. We just need to put it into practice so that um, people will see it. Mm -hmm. Um, what does that mean then? Is that only just doing good works and letting people know, and just you know quietly, or is that being bold about saying I'm doing this and Jesus? Like, what does that look like practically? Well, you have to, we have to be careful that we don't go down the road where it's just good works. Mm -hmm. There has to be that evangelistic mm -hmm. um, kind of um, aspect to it so that um, without being overtly in your face, mm -hmm. right, we have to earn that right mm -hmm. to be able to tell people about that. Yeah. So. And do you believe that's like in relationship and doing, you know, when you're out serving or you're out trying to minister to somebody that it's about building relationships with people so that therefore, yeah. Oh, ab does that look ab like? absolutely. It's, yeah. it's whether it's our neighbor or any like service organization, sometimes it's enough just to let them know that, you know, you're, you attend church or whatever. And then right. they, um, I, I can give you an example. My neighbor, um, knows that he doesn't go to church, never has. Mm -hmm. um, and when his wife died, I, I was, he asked me to go with one other person to go to the graveside wow. to say a prayer for his wife. Right. Even though they they weren't and aren't believers, but he, he, knew. he asked me questions, right? right? And because he knows I go to church, not right. because I've gone up to him and, you know, said, you need to you, you, you need to become a Christian today, right. you know, type of thing. Yeah, it's like about the long so game. It, it can, yeah, it yeah. can be a, it can be a very long process, right? Or it can be quick, right? Yeah, but all that's, kind of in that's God's That's the timing. Holy Spirit's job. That's yeah. not ours. Oh so. man, yeah, truth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, any final thoughts for our church? I, not, not really. I think we've. Um, We've done almost, is it almost 110 years of, of history? And like you, I'd love to see it go for another 100. And as long as we adopt, you know, adapt, I guess, uh, to um, our culture w without compromising 
our belief yes. and our standards. Good morning and welcome to Ridge Church. My name is Krista and I'm the pre-service host for you this morning. This morning we've got communion. So I wanna remind you, go and grab your elements because we will be doing that together in our service after Jonathan has preached the message. I also really wanna encourage you, today is the first time we are able to regather in this building in 2021. It's so exciting. Uh, we really hope that you will consider joining us here on June 13th. We've already got registration open for that. And we even have the potential for two services, one at nine o'clock, one at 10.30, but the only way we'll open those both up is if you register. So hop on the website, go check that out. You can even find links in our social media pages. And we really hope that you will come and regather with us as Ridge Church. We cannot wait to see you. We also wanna let you guys know that we've got Ridge Kids in the building as well. And you can also find that registration at ridgechurch.ca. All right. I wanna let you guys know, June 13th, so that's next Sunday, we've got a prayer night happening, 7 p.m. And we are just so excited to come together in prayer and just spend the night uh, with some worship. Seth will be leading us in that. And then again, just thanking God for his faithfulness, for sustaining us in this season. And again, just to seek him as we head into the summer, it's, it's really gonna be a really an amazing time to do that together. So consider that, consider joining with us. Again, the registration for that is on our website. And I just really wanna uh, clue this in for you, our newsletter, uh, it comes out at the beginning of every month. It's something that I work hard on. I really wanna keep you guys connected. So go check that out. It's in your inbox. And if you haven't received that, there's even a place on our website on the homepage where you can go and sign up for that. It's got all your links. It's got information for how to rejoin teams. It's got uh, information even for the prayer nights and how to regather with us on Sunday morning. So go check that out. All right, one more thing. We've got our general meeting happening June 27th here in the building right after service. Again, you have to sign up for that online, but come and join us, especially if you're a member. We've got some important information for you to check out with that. And again, we're just so excited that you're here with us in the building and online. And uh, let's just join together in prayer as we lead into service. Father, we just thank you so much that we um, are able to be together still online. God, that we are able to be together in this building. And thank you so much for your faithfulness faithfulness to us in this season. Uh, we're so grateful that you have walked alongside and that you've led us and that you're just the God that you are. And Father, would you just go with us into this service? Would you just stir in our hearts what you would have us learn today? And God, would we just worship you in this moment? Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's worship together. All right, Ridge Church, welcome. If you're comfortable, please stand and let's worship together.
that we can have we thank you for the tools of which we can use to worship you and bring glory to you i pray today for pastor dan as he continues to lead us through philippians and i pray that our ears and our hearts will be open and available for you to use this morning i pray to minimize distractions and their attention is focused solely on you in your name amen well, good morning. Uh, this morning, before we turn to the Word of God, I want to take a moment and just ask us to pray. You know, this week uh, in Kamloops, at one of the residential schools there, there was the discovery of uh, the buried bodies of 215 Indigenous children. And for us as a nation, it was shocking and, and disturbing and, and just deeply troubling. And so I think that it's good for us as a congregation uh, to take a moment before we get into God's word this morning and to pray and to ask uh, God uh, for his care and his comfort. The, the scriptures teach us that we are to mourn with those who mourn. And that's what we want to do this morning. So I want to invite you, would you join me? And let's pray, uh, certainly for us as a nation, but also for the indigenous people. And in particular, for those uh, people who are directly affected by by this news, who are tied to somebody uh, who uh, was in that place. So would you bow your head? Let's pray. 
Well, God, this morning we bow our heads and we come to you and God, we grieve for what took place in that school. God, it was wrong and it was wicked. It's hard to fathom that something like that could take place in this nation, and yet God, clearly it did. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort all of us as we mourn. And God, we pray for the indigenous people and ask for your comfort and care for them in these days. And God, especially for those who are personally connected to the, to the children who died at that school. God, we pray for justice and for healing and for reconciliation in our land. And Lord, we pray that you would guide our own hearts as we take in this news, as we seek to follow Jesus in this country, in this day. God, may we be faithful to how you call us to live and to love in this world. And God, we ask for your grace and your peace to be upon all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's, uh, let's turn to the Word of God for today. I want to begin by asking you this. Is there somebody in your world that you would say, this is my favorite teacher or author or Christian leader? Uh, if, if I were to ask you that, who would you, who would you answer? You know, for most people, certainly for me, there'd be two or three or five or six different people that you would list. You say, these are, the, these are the people that I follow. These are the people I buy their books. I listen to their podcasts. Maybe I give to their ministry. I, if I get a chance, you know, I, I go hear them at a conference and, and, and we listen to them. We follow them because we, we like them. We like their style. We like the things that they, they talk about, the topics, and hopefully, hopefully one of the main reasons we like them is because they teach the Word of God with, with passion and conviction and clarity and truth, uh, or, or they lead their organization with wisdom and integrity and, and in the mission that God has given them, and, 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 and because of who they are and what they do, we honor them. Uh, and, and we should, you know, uh, too often we fail to honor the leaders in, the, in our world, certainly in the church, and we need to honor those people who give such gracious and gifted leadership to the church. As long as we're careful not to drift into the whole area of sort of celebrity worship and the celebrity culture, but rather honor them for what they're doing for Christ. You know, in the world of the early church, uh, at least in the Gentile world, there would have been no leader more revered, more honored than the Apostle Paul. Everywhere that he went, everyone wanted to see him, wanted to be around him. Certainly uh, when, he, when he rolled into Rome, I mean, even in chains, he had a profound effect on the local church. They, there was this new invigorated uh, desire to share the gospel, even though some uh, ended up sharing the gospel out of a sense of rivalry with the Apostle Paul. We saw that at the beginning of this letter that he wrote. And so Paul was highly honored as a leader in the early church. But Paul was under no, uh, no illusion that the gospel goes forward just because of great and strong leaders like himself. In fact, he knows that the gospel goes forward because of the, the, the lives and the service of everyday regular Christians, uh, both in Philippi and in Rome and around the world. And so in the, in the letter that he's going to write, uh, that we're studying here, he comes now to a passage where he talks about two of those kind of regular everyday Christians. One is a guy named Timothy, and the other guy is a guy named Epaphroditus. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn back to Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Paul is going to tell them, you know, how these guys are going to be involved in their life. And as he does, he's also going to describe what they're like. Here's what he writes. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God, has, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious." So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So Paul begins by explaining now to the church in Philippi that he's going to send two men to, to visit them. The first he tells, talks about is Timothy. 
He says he's going to send Timothy because he wants Timothy to bring back to him a report of all the good things that are happening in that church. He says, I'm not going to send Timothy right away until I kind of figure out what's happening for me here in Rome. But the second guy that he's going to send them is Epaphroditus. And he's going to send Epaphroditus back right away because he wants him to get back there. And, and probably he's going to deliver this very letter through Epaphroditus. But as he does this, he, he gives an explanation about the, the character of these two men and, and why it is that he is going to send these two men back to him. And, and so we want to look at what he says about these two Christian men and, uh, and, and particularly what he says at the end about them and, and then how that affects us in our lives. So he starts with Timothy. This is what he says in, in chapter 2, verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so I may be cheered by news of you. Now, we know a little bit about Timothy because his name comes up in a number of places throughout the New Testament, as well as there's two letters that the Apostle Paul personally wrote to Timothy. And, and what we know about Timothy, uh, there's a number of things. We know, first of all, that he was, uh, he was the son of a Jewish woman and a Greek man. Uh, we've learned about this in Acts chapter 16. And though it'd be no big deal today, it's no, no big deal. In that day, the fact that he had a mixed ethnic background would have caused him problems. It would have been an issue and a challenge for him no matter where he went in the world around him. But happened to be the background that he had. Uh, we also learn that his father wasn't a spiritual leader. It was his mother and his grandmother who really poured into his life and who did a fantastic job of raising him to follow Jesus. But it must have been hard, both for them and certainly for Timothy, that his father was not involved in his spiritual world at all. We also know that Timothy had health issues. In fact, at one point in his letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, hey, don't just drink water. It's time for you to start drinking some wine, he says, for the sake of your stomach. And then he says, and also because of your many ailments. In other words, Timothy was a guy who had some sort of ongoing health issues in his life. We also know that Timothy was young for the role that God was calling him to. At least, and especially in that culture, he was, he was particularly young. Paul at one point writes to him and he says, look, don't let anyone look down on you for your youth, but rather set an example for them in, in how you live your life and how you love people and how you live your faith and certainly by living in purity. And so we know he was, he was a young guy. And then finally, we know this, that, that Timothy was Paul's protege, but he was no Paul. I mean, he didn't have the charisma, he didn't have the, the skill set, he didn't have the calling that Paul had. And that's okay. It's okay. It was simply who he was. It turns out that Timothy is just this regular guy, this guy who loved Jesus, who had been transformed by the power of Jesus in his life and that, and that was following after Jesus. But now Paul is going to give us the reasons why he's going to send Timothy. He says this in verse 20 and 21. He says, I'm going to send him. He says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm going to send Timothy to you. Uh, first of all, he says, because I have no one like him. In Greek, literally, that line is, I have no one equal in soul. In other, words, in other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that even though Timothy was very different than him, even though he was different gifting, different calling, different temperament, different personality, the fact of the matter is he had the same passion, the same love, the same desire to see the gospel of Jesus go forward. And he guided everything that he did. And this is the first thing that we note about, about Timothy. He had clarity of purpose. Timothy knew who he was and he knew that he wasn't Paul. He wasn't called to be an apostle. He wasn't called to be a great teacher. He wasn't called to be the leader of the, of the Gentile church. But the giftings and the talents and the abilities that Jesus had given him, he wanted to use those for the sake of the gospel, wherever he found himself. And so really, if you read through the New Testament, wherever there's a reference to Timothy, you see him using his skills and his abilities for the glory of God. Whether it's to visit the church in Philippi and check on how they're doing, or to solve some issues, to deal with a mess that's happening in the church in Ephesus, or whether it's to bring some books to the Apostle Paul when he's in jail. Wherever it is, Timothy knows, this is who I am. This is who God made me to be, and therefore, I'm going to live in it. And the fact that he had that kind of clarity of purpose also meant that he didn't get caught up in this sort of consumer mentality. It wasn't sort of this idea that somehow this is just all about me and taking care of my needs, and what does the church do for me? In fact, Paul says, 
all the others seek their own interests and not that of Jesus Christ. Just fascinating. You know, uh, Reggie Campbell, he's a Christian uh, businessman and he, he mentors guys. He collects a group of eight or nine guys. He invites them over to his place and he, uh, he meets with them for the course of a year uh, to mentor them to follow Jesus. But before everything begins, uh, he says to each of the guys, he says, I want you to write a, a short bio of your life, who you are, your family, all that kind of stuff. And I want you to send it to one another and make sure you read it before we come. And then on the day when they first arrive, he gathers them all around and he's taken sort of the news about uh, some information about each of them. And he's put together about a hundred question fill in the blank test. And he just passes it out to each of the guys and says, hey, before we begin, could you fill this out? And there are questions about each other's wives and families and work and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And he says when they turn in their test, at the end of that, they're sheepish because their score is abysmal. Out of 100 questions, the top guys get 17, maybe 18 questions right. He says, why? Why would that be? He says the answer is they're so self-focused. They, they, they just focus on their own deal and what they're doing and not really what everyone else is, is doing. Why would they read about all these other guys? And then he says to them, look, if tonight you were coming to meet with, you know, a, a, a meeting with a big potential customer who could help you meet your sales quota for the year, or if you're meeting with a, a group of corporate executives that would help you with your career, do you think you would have spent the time to figure out, to know about them, to have the answers? Of course you would have. Why? Because you're looking out for yourself. But when it's a group of guys that you're going to walk together in community with for the next year, you don't take the time. I mean, this is, this is a problem. Paul says, Paul says this, to seek the interests of others is to seek the interests of Jesus Christ. He says, this is the characteristic of Timothy. He, he genuinely cares for people. It's so important. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about this uh, very thing. Here's, here's what he says. He says, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will constantly be crossing our paths and canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. We may pass them by preoccupied with our more important tasks as the priest passed by the man who had fallen among thieves, perhaps reading the Bible. It's a strange fact that Christians frequently consider their work so important and urgent that they will allow nothing to disturb them. They think they're doing a, a God a service in this, but actually they are disdaining God's crooked yet straight path. They do not want a life that is crossed and bulked, but it is a part of the discipline of humility that we must not spare our hand where it can perform a service. And that we do not assume that our schedule is our own to manage, but allow it to be arranged by God. You know, to genuinely care for people, even when it's not always convenient, even when it, it causes us to have to change our schedules and what we're doing, that is to attend to the interests of Christ. And if you've ever been genuinely cared for, if someone has ever helped you when you're deep time of need, you know how powerful and beautiful that is in your life. It's more powerful than any sermon that you've ever heard. And that's the ministry of Christ in your life. And, and Paul says, that's who Timothy is. That's what Timothy does. And then he goes on to say, here's two more attributes of him. Verse 22, he says, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. The first characteristic that he reads, that he lists here is Timothy's proven worth. Uh, that expression is a Greek word that is coined or comes out of an expression meaning put to the test. In other words, what he's saying is, here's what you know about Timothy, that he, we have watched him over time and we have watched as he has faced not one test or two, but numerous, numerous tests in his life over the years. And we have found that he is faithful to follow Jesus in those things. Not perfect, but faithful. And what Paul is talking about here is this. He's saying that Timothy has real integrity. The, the man is a man that you can trust. There's something about a follower of Jesus who follows for a long time in the same direction and who face tests and trials and temptations along the way and is faithful to Christ. You know, you can trust that kind of a person. And that's who Timothy is. And then, and then secondly, he describes Timothy as this. He says, as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And what he's talking about there is mentoring. You know, in that day, a son learned the profession of his father as his father mentored him, as he taught him along the way. And he says, this is what Paul is doing for Timothy. He is mentoring him. He is teaching him how to follow Jesus more deeply. 
And in fact, this is the third or fourth actually characteristic that we see in Timothy's life. And that's this, Timothy is committed to ongoing learning. He's committed to continuing to grow spiritually. He didn't just sort of get the basics, say the prayer, and then put his faith on autopilot in the background and get on with his life. Instead, he said, I want to keep learning. I want to keep growing. And I want to learn from somebody who is further down the road than me. And Timothy, Timothy was a learner. He was a follower. And this is, this is who Paul values so very deeply in his life. And this is who he wants to send to the church in Philippi. Not a man who preaches to thousands and leads a great organization, but rather a man who has this deep clarity of purpose and who genuinely cares for them and, and who has this incredible integrity and who is committed to growing deeper in his walk with Jesus. It's the first guy that, that Paul talks about here. But then there's a second guy, and his name is Epaphrodites. Now, you have to understand his story. When the, when the church in Philippi heard that the Apostle Paul was in prison in Rome, they took up a collection. They, they gathered some money for him. And here's why. Because in, in, in that day, if you were put in prison, they just put you in prison. They didn't supply you food or clothing or a pillow to put your head on or anything like that. So if you had no one to come and bring that to you, you'd literally starve to death in prison because they weren't about to do that for you. So the church in Philippi heard about Paul and they gathered all of this money. And then they said, who are we going to get to take it to, to Paul in Rome? And the answer was, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, just a member of their church, he volunteers to travel 1,300 miles from Philippi to Rome to deliver this money and to care for the Apostle Paul. At the end of his letter, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. So they'd sent him these gifts. But somewhere along the way, on that 1,300 kilometer trip, Epaphroditus got sick, like really sick, like to the point of death sick. And you have to remember that in those days, you didn't just like turn off the road to the local, you know, walk-in clinic or emergency room. In that day, to the point of death was like one step and then the next step was death. But the Apostle Paul says, by the mercy of God in Epaphroditus' life, he did not die. And, and so he, he's healed. But the, the deal is that he made it to Rome. He came to Rome to minister to Paul. But news of his illness got back to the people in Philippi. But news of his healing hasn't yet, which means that they're back in Philippi worried sick about what happened to Epaphroditus. So now both Epaphroditus and Paul want to see Epaphroditus get back there so that he can put their mind at ease. So that's what he's going to do. He's going to send them back. But as he sends Epaphroditus, the Apostle Paul again lists the, the character, the attributes of this guy who volunteered to bring him this gift. Here's what he writes. In verse 25, he says this. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Five words that he uses there to describe Epaphroditus. First of all, brother. In these days, everyone calls everyone brother. Hey, brother. And they haven't even met him before. It was great. No problem. But you have to understand that in that day, there was no greater bond between two people than being brother and sister. The, 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 you know, just that, those siblings. And Paul says that Epaphroditus was a brother in Christ. The relationship between them wasn't just transactional. You know, Epaphroditus didn't just show up and hand him the bag of money and Paul shook his hand and they put their arms around each other and took a picture and, and off he went. That's not what happened. Rather, Epaphroditus came and he poured his life and his heart into the Apostle Paul and vice versa. And they became brothers in Christ. And see, here's what, what uh, the Epaphroditus has. He has genuine relationships. You know, there are a few things as powerful and as deep as genuine relationships between two people that are not based on common blood from, from shared parents, but based on the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. The fact of what Jesus has done in, in each of their lives led them to this deep bond between one another. And so they walk together as brothers. Paul says, this is my brother in Christ. Secondly, he says that Epaphroditus was someone who was faithful and obedient. And we know that because he uses two words to describe him next. First of all, he calls him a fellow worker. You know, there is a work that is involved in seeing the gospel go forward. It doesn't sort of magically happen. It's not like a church just sort of sets down in a place and, and suddenly it just sort of magically happens that people start coming to faith in Jesus. There's toil and struggle and sweat and, and setbacks sometimes and work to be done. And Epaphroditus shows up and he rolls up his sleeves and he goes to work. And Paul says, here's a man who is faithful to the call of God on his life. But then secondly, he calls him a fellow soldier. 
You, you know, you have to understand. I mean, we know this, that he and, and, and Paul were fellow soldiers under the command of Jesus. And soldiers don't go by suggestions. They go by commands. And so a commanding officer comes to soldiers and says, I want you guys to go and I want you to hold Hill 52. Hold it until the reinforcements come. When the commanding officer says that to soldiers, they don't put up their hand and say, ah, uh, actually, can I serve in the kitchen instead because it's safer to peel potatoes than to hold F Hill 52. It doesn't work that way. Instead, they go and they hold Hill 52 until reinforcements come or else they die trying to hold it because they understand that they're part of something greater than just themselves and that their commanding officer has a, a broader picture in, in view of what it is that is ultimately going to be accomplished. And so Paul says that Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier. Not only was he faithful, but he was obedient to what Christ called him to do, even as it cost him. And then he goes on, he uses these two terms. He says that Epaphroditus was your messenger and minister to my need. Now the words that he used there are fascinating. Uh, the word messenger is literally the word apostle. It's the same Greek word. In other words, he says, Epaphroditus was your apostle to me. Now, he doesn't mean apostle in the same sense that he or the other 11 disciples that saw the risen Christ are apostles. But what he means is Epaphroditus was your messenger of good news, your messenger of hope. Because what Epaphroditus brought him was a message that we're praying for you in Philippi. We're behind you. We're supporting you. We're with you. It was his message of hope in his life. And then he also says, your minister. And that, that word is a word that speaks of a priestly duty. In other words, Epaphroditus was the hands and feet of Jesus that it came to him through them to serve his physical, practical needs. In other words, Epaphroditus was a messenger to him of both hope and help. And sometimes, I mean, in your world, certainly in my world, when, when there's chaos, when you're fearful or panicky or feeling anxious and stress, God sends into your life somebody like that. You know, typically for me, it's not, it's not the famous guy that I'm listening to out of the States or the guy that I'm reading that's written a brilliant book, although I always appreciate their insights and their word. But for me, it's often just the, a regular guy, the guy that nobody else knows but comes into my life and cares for me and listens to me and points me to Jesus and serves me in my time of need. And you know, that person, that regular person becomes in my life the apostle and the, and the minister to my needs, the apostle and the priest. And it's more powerful again than so many other things. And it just happens when regular followers of Jesus serve one another. That's the kind of person that Epaphroditus was. In fact, uh, and, and he did that kind of thing all the time. And then there's one more descriptor that the Apostle Paul gives for Epaphroditus, and that says he was courageous. Look at verse 30. Paul writes this, For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service for me. Epaphroditus took a great risk to serve the Apostle Paul. I mean, he traveled 1,300 kilometers on foot with a big bag of money through, uh, to, a, to a city that he didn't know, through countryside that probably wasn't always the safest, to deliver it to a political prisoner under Nero in Rome itself. I mean, the man took a serious risk for the sake of the gospel. And, and he's just a regular guy. And yet, he had this courage in his life. There's this fascinating story out of the history of the early church that arose out of Epaphroditus' life. Uh, the story takes place in the year 252 in the city of Carthage in North Africa, a major city in the Roman Empire. Uh, in 252, the plague came to, to Carthage. And of course, in that day, they didn't have the kind of medical resources that we had. And so people were dying all over the place. And the city officials ordered that every corpse be carried out of the city, but they also forced anyone who might have possibly come in contact with the plague out of the city, which meant that there were all sorts of people who were outside with no resources outside the city suffering and dying from the plague. And the bishop of, of the church of Carthage, a man named Cyprian, called together the church. And he said to the, to the members of the church, he said, there are all those people out there dying and alone. Who is it that is going to leave the comfort and the safety of their home? Who is it that God is calling to risk their very lives for the sake of the gospel and go and minister to those people? And there was a whole group of people who did that very thing, uh, who left the city and went out and risked their lives, some of them dying, to care for these very people. 
And, and what began in that day in Carthage was a movement that was called the Parabolani. Uh, literally, it was based on this Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses here. It's, it meant a group of people who were risking their lives for the sake of the gospel. And it was a movement that began in Carthage in the year 252 and went on for several hundred years in the life of the church. And over those several hundred years, hundreds and thousands of regular everyday Christians, many, all of whose names we will never know except for the people who knew them themselves. Jesus will never know their names. They risked their lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was Epaphroditus, courageous, a messenger of hope and help, faithful and obedient, a man who built genuine, deep relationships with the people around him. But he wasn't a pastor, a teacher, a famous leader. There's no podcast, no conferences, no articles in Christianity today. He was just a regular guy who loved Jesus in his everyday life. And this is what Paul says about him. Verse 29. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such man. Receive him with all joy and honor such man. You know, the call on us is to honor men and women like this. We, we obviously should honor those who are leaders in the church, those who are incredibly gifted to preach and teach and lead. Uh, absolutely. But let's be careful that we don't put them on a pedestal and forget to honor the amazing, incredible, everyday servants of Jesus in our midst who don't have that kind of platform. People like Timothy and Epaphroditus. And our church is filled with people like that. And I know because I've met so many of you and in totally unassuming, in the most humble of ways, you are living and faithfully following Jesus. You know, a while back, I said to one of the guys in our church, I said, hey, let's, let's meet uh, for coffee. I want to catch up and see what's happening in your world. Can we meet at 10 in the morning? He said, ah, do you mind if we meet at 1030? I said, oh, no problem. Why? He said, I, because before that, I'm taking a Servan and teaching him how to drive. Now, if you were here last week, you would have met Servan. Servan and Lelif are the refugee couple that we, our church has, has sponsored and we have cared for this past year as they've come to Canada. And this guy was helping him learn to drive. Now, I don't know if you've ever helped someone learn to drive, maybe one of your kids. It's terrifying. I mean, it takes courage to do that. And it's one thing to do it for your kid. It's another thing to do it for somebody that, that isn't your kid. And, and yet that's, that's what, what this guy was doing. He was taking his time and, and teaching Servan how to, how to drive. And in fact, just this week, I met another lady in our church who is teaching Lilith how to drive. And in fact, there is this entire group of people in our church that have so quietly and so humbly served that family in such beautiful ways because of what Jesus has done in their own lives. And it's their way of loving and sharing and caring for them. And I know of others you who you just know you're gifting. You know how God has created you and wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, you are serving in Jesus name. And I just know it because everywhere I go, when I bump into you, there you are doing whatever God has given you to do for the sake of the gospel. It's so encouraging. And you know, I have spoken to a number of husbands uh, at this church who have, who have sacrificed in, in, in some cases long term for their wives and for their children, for their families in, in, the, in all kinds of ways. The kinds of sacrifices that most men would never dream of making. And they've done it without fanfare and with such deep humility in their lives. In some cases, in ways that only God himself will ever see and ever know of. And it's unbelievable what they have done for their wives. And I am absolutely positive that there are wives who have done the same for their husbands and for their children, faithfully following Jesus in all kinds of ways. And I know others of you who have walked through some deep waters around here at the church. I mean, it, over the last number of years, when things have been difficult and hard, you just faithfully followed Jesus, faithfully continued to serve him. And you've done and been so committed to the mission and the ministry of our church, and you've done it with such deep integrity through it all. And I spoke again not long ago with a guy who, who along with his wife, are caring for another family in our church uh, as they too walk through really difficult times. And, and, and though it cost this man and his wife a lot of energy and time and sometimes frustration, they do it out of their, their love for that family because they have such a deep relationship with them, but also because of their love for Christ. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And I could go on and list all kinds of other examples. I mean, you've been seeing, if you've been watching our pre-service, uh, the example of some of the, the, the legacy stories we've been telling, people who have been here so many years and many others, 
all so humbly and never wanting this story, never sort of told publicly and yet faithfully serving Jesus in all kinds of amazing, beautiful ways. None famous, none, none who will ever, you know, be known outside of us and the people in their world and Jesus. Apostle Paul says this about them. We should honor men and women like that. We should receive them with, what, with such joy. You know, the, the church needs its upfront leaders. We need to honor them. But as it goes forward, the most profound effect, the, the most beautiful work of the gospel of Jesus Christ happens in, through the lives of all kinds of regular, everyday, amazing, incredible Christians who live their lives in a, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're doing it not for rec recognition, not for fame, but rather simply out of their love for Jesus and what he has done for them. In fact, everything that we do really is because of Jesus and for Jesus and through Jesus. And so today, I want to end our time together by celebrating communion, by remembering that it's because of Jesus' death and resurrection that we have the life that we have. And in particular today in our communion, we want to remember his death and, and the price that he paid and the covenant that he made on the cross with us. And so I want to invite you at, at this point to, to take the bread that you have there or whatever the element is that you have, the bread, and, and to, to take it in your hand. And, and the place that we want to start as we share communion again is by examining our own heart, by remembering again that we have sinned against God, that it is only by what Jesus did on the cross that we are right before him and by confessing our sins and making sure that we're right before God. And so I just want to invite you to take some time right now to do that very thing, to confess your sins, to quiet your heart, to thank God for what he's done in your life. And then we'll, we'll eat the bread together. So let me give you a moment. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat it together. And then the cup. The Bible says this, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant that is in my blood. Drink this whenever you do in remembrance of me. Let's drink this cup together. Now let's pray. But God, today, again, we are reminded of the incredible sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross in our place. God, we confess again that we are sinners, that we are broken, that we are far from perfect, but that we serve a perfect God, such a good God who would send his own son to suffer and to die, that we might have life, that we might know life through him. And Father, even as we listen today to your words about Timothy and Epaphroditus, about their character and their commitment to you, God, our heart too is that in our everyday regular lives, that we would live before you in a way that honors you, in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not perfect, God, none of us are perfect, but Father, as we strive to live in a way that you would be glorified in our lives, that you would be lifted high. God, that you uh, would take pleasure in what we do. And so God, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life we have in him. And God, we ask that you would lead us as we continue to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's continue to remember what Jesus sacrificed for us as we finish our service and worship.
from a prayerless heart. My praise has been offered from a praiseless sound. Skill no more, all oh, that has lost its sting. You silence the evil roar, you have the final say. My shame has been removed, my tears have been wiped clean. Your love has overcome, you are my victory. I wear this skill no more, all oh, death has lost its sting. Silence evil roar. You have the final say. My shame has been removed. My tears have been wiped clean. You love has overcome. You are my victory. I wear this skill.
Once again, we thank you for today. We thank you for this coming together. We thank you for the sermon, and we thank you for just the Bible and the Word and, and what we can learn from it and how we can live our lives from it and all the resources you've given us. And I pray that the sermon this morning doesn't just go in one ear and out the other, but it's, it's something that motivates us for the week ahead and the months ahead. Uh, we thank you for this time that you've given us on earth, and I pray that we spend it how you've intended us to spend it, by living our lives out for you and by spreading your word to others. So once again, thank you to God from this place. In your name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I want to let you know that we are open for services in person. And if people register, we have the potential to have two services next Sunday. And we would love to see you here. So please do go online, register to come and join us here. It's going to be fantastic. Also want to encourage you to join us next Sunday night at 7 p.m. for an evening of prayer. We want to pray again, thanking God for his faithfulness to us as a church over this past season and seeking his face as we head into this next season. And we'd love to see you there. All right, I want to end by reading to you again the words of the Apostle Paul out of the, the letter to the Ephesians. He writes this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Look forward to seeing you here soon.